All right, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Genevieve Bates, who will be talking to us about transitional justice in world politics. Dr. Genevieve Bates is an assistant professor of political science at the University of British Columbia and a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. She received her BA in political science from Yale University and her PhD in political science from the University of Chicago in 2021. Her research focuses on transitional justice and human rights, with a particular focus on accountability in the aftermath of mass political violence. She has published in Perspectives on Politics, the Journal of Human Rights and Foreign Policy. Her research asks questions such as, how might threats from international institutions impact on the ground negotiations about justice and accountability? How can the promises and pitfalls of accountability shape transitions from dictatorship to democracy? And do transitional justice mechanisms help or hurt new democracies? These questions are instrumental to understanding the functioning of democracies today, and we are honored to have her speak to us about her work on transitional justice. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bates to the Albright Institute. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm actually really excited to talk to you all about transitional justice. Um, and thank you, Mariella, for the wonderful introduction. That was like a very thorough description of me and my work. Um, so I am a political scientist, like three levels of it, BA, PH, well, MA and PhD, all in political science. Um, and I study comparative politics and international relations, depending on who you ask, with a focus uh, in particular on questions of justice and human rights. Um, and so some of my work looks at this in the context of transitions from dictatorship to democracy. Um, and some of it looks at it in the context of transitions from conflict to peace. And actually some of my most recent work looks at it in a totally different sort of context, uh, which is in non-transitional societies, places like much closer to home, like here in the United States. So today I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time talking about what transitional justice is in all of its sort of messy details and why researchers like me ask questions about it. Uh, okay, so first, uh, some, some context. So these photos are from France in like 1944, 1945, during the so-called Wild Purge. So in the weeks and months following the Allied liberation of France, a wave of uncontrolled violence sort of like swept the newly liberated country. It was particularly targeting um, people who were accused of having collaborated with the Vichy regime. So this was seen as punishment for that collaboration, and it included everything from like, unsanctioned killings of accused collaborators to this sort of infamous uh, process of shaving the heads of women accused of horizontal collaboration with the Nazis. So to give you some numbers here, an estimated 6,000 people were killed during this wild purge, and 20,000 women had their heads shaved. Okay, flashing forward a few decades. In 1975 in Spain, longtime dictator Francisco Franco died of heart failure, sort of beginning the process of ushering in a transition from a dictatorship under Franco to a democracy. Um, in the wake of his death, the parties of the right and the left agreed to sort of put aside their differences and put aside the, the sources of tensions resulting from the Spanish Civil War and the atrocities that had been committed under the Franco regime uh, in what has come to be known as the Pact of Forgetting. Two years later, in 1977, they formalized this Pact of Forgetting by passing a broad amnesty law that did some good things, which included freeing political prisoners and allowing people 
who had been in exile to return without concern of being put in jail. But it also ensured that nobody who had participated in the atrocities, especially under the Franco regime, would ever face accountability for them. So were either of these things transitional justice? And what could make us certain? Well, we, there are a few different ways that we can know it when we see it. We should start with maybe a definition. What is transitional justice? My favorite definition actually comes from Wikipedia, which most people don't like to hear. Um, transitional justice, as defined in Wikipedia, is a procedure to respond to massive human rights violations that implements judicial redress, political reforms in a region or country, and other measures in order to stop human rights abuses. But regardless of how you define it, transitional justice, or TJ, sort of refers to the policies or procedures put in place um, in the wake of transitions out of periods of political violence, with the understanding of political violence to be kind of broadly construed. Regardless of the definition, for most people, transitional justice has become synonymous with a certain set of policies, what we call transitional justice mechanisms. So I'm going to go through what those are and provide you with a few examples. So the first uh, and probably most commonly understood one when people talk about transitional justice is criminal trials. So this is exactly what you think it is. If anybody's seen an episode of Law and Order, it's a criminal trial. Um, but these can happen in the domestic arena, like what occurred in 1985 in Argentina against the former leadership of the military junta there um, after its transition to democracy. But it can also happen in the international arena. Probably the most famous case of criminal trials occurring in the international arena in the context of transitional justice would be the trials against the, the remaining uh, high-level uh, Nazi officials at Nuremberg after the Allied victory against uh, the Nazis. More recently, a permanent international criminal tribunal, so like a permanent version of Nuremberg, has been created, um, the International Criminal Court, and it is charged with holding individuals responsible for these major human rights violations, um, things like war crimes and genocide. Okay, so that's criminal trials. Also included, in mechanisms of transitional justice is sort of the flip side of criminal trials, amnesties, like what we saw in Spain in 1977. So this is what amnesties are, are basically implementing a set of policies that stop criminal trials from occurring against perpetrators of abuses. And we still consider this transitional justice for a, very, a variety of reasons. Um, one of the biggest being that when people are making trade-offs, um, which are oftentimes necessary in the context of transitions from authoritarianism to democracy or conflict to peace, sometimes uh, amnesty is going to be an important tool in ensuring sort of peace and stability. Okay. Next comes uh, vetting and lustration, uh, like what occurred in much of post-communist Eastern Europe. Uh, in the wake of the end of communism. Uh, and this mostly deals with employment, for lack of a better way of putting it. And what vetting and lustration do is they essentially say that for a group of people who either participated in a set of human rights violations or collaborated with those who did, either in secret or in the open, um, they can't hold a certain set of positions. Oftentimes, they are within the state bureaucracy, or um, in politics. And this example comes from Poland. Um, next comes truth commissions, which are, to give a formal definition, quasi-judicial institutions aimed to advance accountability through comprehensive accounts of political violence. What truth commissions essentially do is try to collect as much information about a period of political violence and um, 
present a sort of formal accounting of what occurred during this period of political violence. They often also produce a set of recommendations for what should be implemented to ensure that this kind of political violence doesn't happen again. The by far the most famous example of a truth commission is the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was created in the early to mid 90s in the wake of the democratic transition uh, and end of apartheid in South Africa. On the sort of less famous side of transitional justice, uh, we have a set of policies that are maybe more focused on the victims of political violence. So the first example here is reparations, um, which are essentially uh, a set of policies that can be implemented to um, provide support in various ways to the victims of atrocities. This can include everything from the cold, hard cash to restoring like, property rights to people who had their property taken uh, to even community-based reparations. So the example that I have up on the screen here uh, is from Peru in the early 2000s, um, and it's the Peruvian Community Reparations Program. So this was implemented after Peru's transition to democracy in the wake of the end of the uh, dictatorship of Alberto Fujimori. Um, and under that dictatorship, uh, in particular, indigenous Peruvians were um, targeted for sort of widespread uh, abuse, and the Peruvian Community Reparations Program was a way of trying to provide redress for those kinds of abuses. So they uh, provided funds to do things like build community centers, schools, etc. Uh, then we have memory projects, which is sort of a big category of things. Um, and this is anything that is put in place to try to memorialize or um, remember the atrocities that have been committed and the victims of those atrocities. So some examples that I have up here include the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Chile, which uh, was built and opened and <laughs> designed to memorialize the victims of atrocities under the dictatorship of uh, Augusto Pinochet in the wake of Chile's transition to democracy. Um, but also I have up on the screen here a, a very different way of memorial memorializing victims of atrocities. And this comes from Rwanda in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, many of these are still around today, uh, that is designed to memorialize the victims of the Rwandan genocide. Um, so oftentimes these memorial projects are in what were once churches, which is where many victims uh, of the Rwandan genocide fled as they were trying to, to hide from people trying to kill them. And then these massacres occurred in churches and what effectively the Rwandan government decided to do was leave those remains exactly, uh, not exactly where they were left, but basically to leave those remains in churches to try to sort of um, show us the scale of the atrocities that occurred during the genocide. And finally, we have an, e an even bigger tent kind of nebulous idea, uh, local processes or what's sometimes called customary uh, justice practices. Um, and this is, there are lots of different things that are considered local processes. Um, the thing that sort of unifies them is that uh, local or customary justice processes uh, root their um, existence in, in previously uh, held practices uh, around justice and accountability, um, and then are sort of reappropriated for the context of transitional justice. Uh, so some examples that I have here are from Rwanda in the early 2000s. Um, in the wake of the genocide, uh, 
lots, lots of people participated and the Rwandan government, uh, like the normal uh, criminal justice system could not process uh, the people accused of participating in the genocide uh, at any scale that would be reasonable. Like people were, had just been in, held in jail for, uh, for almost a decade at that point. And so they uh, sort of re uh, appropriated a, pra a traditional practice called gachacha um, and created these community courts to help, uh, in many ways, just ease the burden on the criminal justice system in Rwanda. Another example is something called Mato Oput, which is an, a practice in northern Uganda amongst the Cho Acholi population that has been used to help um, reintegrate uh, former Lord's Resistance Army um, members into their communities. Okay, this is all just the surface, though. Uh, transitional justice as an idea and a research field is underpinned by both conceptual and like normative philosophical questions that are deeply connected to the issue of politics. What are some of these questions? Well, things like who faces transitional justice? Is it mostly about those who commit abuses? Or is it about the victims? Out of the people who've committed abuses, what kinds of abuses should be considered sort of ripe for transitional justice? Who even is a victim? Which gets to my next, well, my third part of this. When is transitional justice? What do transitions have to do with any of this? Um, is the transition part of transitional justice even useful for us anymore? And third, why transitional justice? This is perhaps the most important question. Why implement it at all? What is it that we expect transitional justice to do? And what might be some of the effects of implementing? transitional justice. Okay, so I'm gonna take them a little bit out of order now. We're gonna start with when transitional justice. Transitions from what to what? Well, this is sort of a hotly contested debate even within the field of transitional justice. Um, I think most people would broadly agree that transitional justice encompasses at least two things. The first being transitions from authoritarianism to democracy like what occurred in uh, Eastern Europe in the late 80s and early 90s as uh, communist dictatorships uh, fell across the region and ushered in periods of democracy. The photo I have here is from Berlin in 1989 as the wall was coming down. Um, but it can also include transitions from conflict to peace which is this second example that I have up on the screen, which comes from Colombia in 2016, when at least formally a decades-long conflict between the Colombian government and the primary rebel group there, the FARC, uh, ended with the signing of a historic peace agreement. But this can also include things that are maybe a little less uh, straightforward. At least for some people, it can include these things. Um, in recent years, the transition part of transitional justice has sort of come into question, certainly for scholars and practitioners of TJ. Uh, as, as we have started to look inward and think about how mechanisms of transitional justice might apply even in non-transitional contexts, contexts like the United States, uh, as it has uh, engaged in a period of racial reckoning, um, or Canada, as it has uh, attempted to address uh, a historical set of abuses and contemporary set of abuses against its indigenous population. Okay, next. Who gets transitional justice or who faces it? Is transitional justice just for those who've committed abuses? 
Or is it for those who actually experienced that violence as well? And what violence counts for the purposes of transitional justice? So most people would widely agree that the Nuremberg trials were transitional justice, that the Nazi leadership deserved to face accountability for the things that it did. But few would agree that the wild purge in France in the same era is transitional justice, that the shaving of the heads of women for horizontal collaboration would count as transitional justice. If you ask any TJ scholar, nobody would tell you that that's transitional justice. So how do we know what it is? Is it just about who it is that we are targeting? Or is it about what they are being targeted for and the mechanism by which they face that accountability? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the question of why transitional justice? Unsurprisingly, this is in many ways the most controversial part of the study of TJ. Um, and that's because TJ is often seen by academics and TJ advocates alike as sort of the like be all end all of producing good outcomes, especially in these more formalized transitions like from conflict to peace or dictatorship to democracy. So why implement it? What are the goals? Well, there are four sort of big goals commonly associated with transitional justice. The first is that it creates a break with the past. Now this break is both symbolic and literal. It captures on the literal side changes in policies and institutions from sort of one political order to the next. So policies and institutions uh, changing from dictatorship to democracy or from conflict to peace. But it also represents a sort of larger cultural shift, an idea that there's some thing changing about society uh, in the wake of this transition. The next sort of commonly stated benefit of transitional justice, another why for why it's implemented, is that it supports democracy and contributes to democratic consolidation. Um, transitional justice helps, according to advocates, by doing things like, for example, removing bad faith actors from positions of power in the new democratic or peaceful society, and um, that helps to sort of support democratic institution building. Um, a third commonly stated belief is that it supports um, peace and stability and human rights promotion in the places that implement transitional justice. And the idea here is that it can create this sort of new um, democratic culture. And why is that useful for these things? Well, it takes violence off the table for people. That by implementing mechanisms of transitional justice, people no longer think that resorting to violence is an appropriate way of addressing grievances. And the last reason why people implement transitional justice in these transitioning societies is, in my opinion, perhaps the single most controversial one, which is that it leads to reconciliation between those who've been victimized and those who have victimized. Um, and the idea here is that it leads to reconciliation by countering denial of the past. If we all agree that what has occurred in the past, then that can lead us toward taking the steps to reconcile with one another. Um, it also is supposed to help by expanding dialogue within society um, and helping to address both individual and societal trauma. Okay, but as is the case with democratization, discourse more generally, and I think we're seeing this especially now, um, in, in the field of studying uh, democracy and, and democratic consolidation, transitional justice advocates have previously assumed that basically all good things go together. That by implementing transitional justice, you can get all of these outcomes, all at the same time, regardless of the mechanisms that you implement. Um, but the real question is, is that even true? Are these goals all compatible with one another? And are the mechanisms that you 
that you implement in the context of transitional justice all equally likely to produce all of these good outcomes. So for example, people often ask, are the mechanisms that support this breaking with the past, again, both uh, literally and um, conceptually, uh, are they perfectly compatible with this, the mechanisms that help promote democracy or promote peace and stability? What about the mechanisms that help promote democracy and those that promote reconciliation? Are those going to be the same mechanisms? And are they all going to be equally likely in producing these kinds of good outcomes? Maybe not always. I can certainly think of some examples where that might not be true. So while advocates have argued that all good things go together, researchers have increasingly sought to test those kinds of questions. I have a few examples up here on the screen. Um, we have worked to measure the effects of transitional justice on these really big goals, uh, things like reconciliation um, or uh, even smaller goals, smaller goals. Things like just telling the truth and setting the record straight about things that have happened during this period of political violence, or even stopping atrocities from occurring again in the future. Um, so some of the examples that I have up here are scholars who have looked at things like whether truth commissions can help promote reconciliation, or even whether things like criminal trials can help deter atrocities in the future. Okay, but what about the flip side? Can transitional justice backfire? Increasingly, research has started to explore the extent to which the same mechanisms that have been uh, you know, allegedly implemented to promote democracy may actually help to erode it. So some of the examples that I have up here are things like um, the memory projects and gachacha courts that were implemented in Rwanda in the wake of the genocide um, are also things that have been used to help sort of entrench the power of the not so new authoritarian regime um, that sort of emerged in the wake of the Rwandan genocide. So was transitional justice actually helpful for Rwanda or did it just help increase the power of Paul Kagame? Uh, a, a more recent examples uh, come from uh, post-communist Eastern Europe, places like Poland and Hungary, where lustration and vetting laws originally designed to help clear out uh, secret and open collaborators with the communist dictatorships in the wake of, its, of, their democrat, of the democratic transitions in these countries in the mid-90s have increasingly been used to basically gut um, especially courts of people who would be opponents to sort of like the growing uh, right-wing authoritarian leaders in Poland and Hungary. All of which is to say that the results of our research on whether transitional justice can help or hurt democracy remains really mixed. The results on whether or not TJ can actually lead to these good outcomes that we all have assumed in the past that it can lead to actually are, are far more mixed than we might hope. But as with all research, especially in the realm of political violence and human rights, those of us who study this care deeply about answering these kinds of questions because we understand that it can really um, affect people's lives on the ground. So we continue to search for answers about it. Um, thank you. And I am happy to answer any and all questions about this or anything else. <laughs> So we're going to move first to, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I really want to open it up to everybody else. Um, so, but let me, uh, but I, 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 I feel like the, the, the first thing I want to push you on is, I, I'm dying 
I'm dying to know, mm -hmm. like what you're thinking instinctually here, right? Because you had a number of different mechanisms, and then you pointed out, you know, there are all these trade-offs, right? Can you point out maybe two mechanisms that you think in particular are in conflict with one and each other? Like in other words, like if you're trying to get, you know, democratic consolidation on the one hand, and then, you know, prevent conflict on the other, are there two mechanisms that really like actually produce friction? So I think that most people would argue that the the biggest trade-offs in, in terms of the goals of transitional justice, that perhaps the biggest trade-offs are um, this question of peace and stability on one side and accountability and breaking with the past on the other. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you hold criminal trials or even implement lustration and vetting policies against those who've committed atrocities, do you incentivize them to engage in further violence? This is traditionally thought of as the peace justice divide. Now, I personally don't buy into this, but this is like a huge thing in the transitional justice literature, is that can you both have justice in the con and with the understanding of justice being especially criminal accountability. Can you both have justice and have peace? Well, this is, I mean, in many ways, this is the argument you see, I mean, and it's global, right? The argument against, you know, you forget in order to become a people and move on and have some order, or you open it up and you have truth and you have disorder. So, and it, but basically, you're saying that dichotomy is itself, I'm losing a word other than one I can't say right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that dichotomy is less. Um, less of a like strict dichotomy than especially early transitional justice researchers would have argued. And, and I think that that's just because um, we've had enough time now of implementing these kinds of policies to understand that bad faith actors are bad faith actors. It doesn't matter if you promise them am amnesty or send them to jail. <laughs> they, 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 they are who they are. They are who they are. So if I can switch gears a bit, um, yeah, pop a little bit. Because well, one thing you brought at the beginning, and I'm familiar with this this research from you, um, <laughs> is your search research on inst international institutions and the way in which they reinforce or can undermine transitional justice. Because I think at least in my mind, certainly there was a moment in the 1990s, 2000s, where the gold standard of transitional justice was that an international organization was going to come in, right, set up a court, find the bad guys try that, right? You suggest that it might not be so straightforward. What, what are some of the ways in which international organizations can complicate processes of transitional justice? I know that's a big question, so. Yeah, so, um, well in some ways, okay, I'm gonna answer the flip side of that question first. Well, they can reinforce yeah, so in some ways, there are contexts in which I think that international uh, organizations, especially those seeking to promote transitional justice, so my research focuses on the International Criminal Court, um, I think there are ways that they can reinforce it. Um, I think that it depends on the context, it depends on how likely domestic actors are to really see these institutions as a threat, as opposed to as an opportunity for sort of furthering their own interests. Um, and so a huge part of what is in my work, a huge part of what I think is going on um, that answers the question, do these kinds of institutions help or hurt, is about what local power dynamics are like in the countries where these institutions are set up. Uh, so uh, an example, I'm going to totally not even talk about the ICC. So an example, um, I just have Rwanda on the mind because I used a lot of uh, examples for Rwanda in my talk. But So for example, in Rwanda, uh, in the wake of the genocide, the UN Security Council authorized the creation of the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, and the idea was that it was supposed to hold accountable um, those most responsible for atrocities that occurred during and after the Rwandan genocide. Um, the uh, people in power after the Rwandan genocide, who are still currently in power in Rwanda, were from sort of one side of a civil war that was occurring sort of under, under the surface of this genocide. Uh, they were rebel groups that 
swept into Uganda in, in the midst of the genocide and ended it by winning the war. Um, so you create the ICTR, which is designed to hold presumably everybody accountable. Uh, but the Rwandan government at the time, this rebel group that swept in and won the war, had no expectation of being held accountable for the atrocities that they had committed because they committed atrocities in the process of winning the war and in the immediate aftermath. Um, and so ultimately the ICTR, because this rebel group turned government was so powerful, ultimately the ICTR just became an international body of holding the opponents, the, the former government, the opponents to the rebels accountable. And don't get me wrong, they did some really bad things. They, they deserve to be held accountable. But perhaps so did Paul Kagame. Right. And then once you actually have your thumb on the scales, and we were talking about this earlier, the kind of illegitimacy then that can come from the future perception of the institution. Yes. Uh, before I, t I, I turn it over um, to, to, to the fellows, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about both what got you here as well as where you're going. Because one thing you said at the end, and, and, and I thought really you know, passionately, was that people who do transitional justice, they do it because they're normally committed. Yeah. Can I ask, how did you come to this, 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 this field of research? Yeah, uh, OK, I'll try to cut down what's kind of a long story. Uh, I came to it but in a super roundabout way. So when I was an undergraduate, um, I got the opportunity to do this um, internship program abroad. And I interned with a member of parliament in Uganda for a summer. And she is now a minister there, which I think is very interesting. Um, but she is a, a Choli, and she's from northern Uganda. And in the course of my summer interning for her, she and I had countless conversations about the Civil War, which had sort of died down in, in northern Uganda by the time I got, uh, got to Kampala. Uh, but she and I had had all of these conversations about uh, the sort of intersection of exactly this justice and peace sort of question. Um, so the International Criminal Court had uh, issued arrest warrants for a bunch of the rebel leaders in Uganda. And uh, at least the conventional wisdom is that these arrest warrants really, really hampered the prospect for peace negotiations. Um, and that the Acholi population, uh, who was the most victimized uh, by both the Ugandan military and the rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, were really, really opposed uh, to these arrest warrants being issued because what they cared most about was the end of the violence. Um, and so I, I just got really interested in the topic and I came back to um, school in the fall and I decided, I was in my senior year, I decided I wanted to research that for my sort of undergraduate thesis in political science and I just wasn't done yet. And so I kept going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. You just kept going. And now you're saying you're moving on, you've, you've done this primarily from an international comparative perspective. And you're starting to do it from looking okay. domestic perspective. Turning well. inward at it, yeah. How is that tra transition going? You it's um, so it's really interesting. Um, so you know this, but I'll say it to everybody. Uh, so subdisciplines within political science sometimes don't talk to each other very much. Um, and so there's a whole subfield that focuses just on American politics. Um, and then there's comparative politics, which is everything that's not American politics. Um, and then there's international relations, which is by and large the stuff that's sort of above the other two uh, in terms of like the unit of analysis. Um, and so it's been interesting because it's the right moment, I think, to be doing this kind of stuff because people who study the United States primarily have especially in the wake of things like the January 6th insurrection started to really realize that maybe the US isn't so special after all. Um, and maybe things that have been happening elsewhere in the world for a much longer time and taken seriously elsewhere in the world for a much longer time are relevant for studying things that are happening right now in the US. 
And so as somebody who has been studying things that happen elsewhere in the world for a long time, seeing the extent to which the same kinds of questions can apply when you look at things like racial justice in the United States, um, has, it's been really fruitful. Um, and I think there's at least, uh, at least in some parts of the discipline, there's appetite for it. So. Well, I want to turn it over to, to all of the fellows for questions about transitional justice. And we'll be bringing mics around so people can hear. Um, hi. Um, thank you so much. That was really, really very interesting and captivating. So thank you so much for your, for your time thank here. You. Um, this is a very speculative question, but your research sort of made me think of like conflicts taking place right now and with Ukraine. Um, you know, do you have any ideas? Do you have any possible approaches? This is obviously very difficult because we don't know of everything that's happened and gone on, but what would you advise <laughs> in a possible, you know, transitional justice? Oh, what would I advise? <laughs> I'm an academic for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you what's already going on. Um, so the International Criminal Court, that permanent international criminal, criminal tribunal, um, has an open investigation into atrocities committed in Ukraine. Um, it is actively, the prosecutor's office and investigators are actively collecting evidence. Like, I think they've had like, a weird amount of access to, um, to like, the on the ground sort of, they've had a weird amount of on the ground access, uh, in my opinion, to Ukraine because the conflict is still active. Um, but effectively what has been happening is that like, as Ukrainian forces take back areas, investigators come behind them and investigate some of the atrocities that have been occurring. So that's happening on one end. Um, they can investigate uh, and hold accountable anybody, uh, highest level people is mostly who they focus on, uh, responsible for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The big question right now is there's this like other crime in international law called the crime of aggression uh, that they cannot, for super technical reasons in the treaty, they can't actually investigate that. They can in other contexts, but not in Ukraine. So there's been a big discussion in, especially spearhe spearheaded by uh, Ukrainian officials and people like, and, and officials in uh, the European Union um, to create sort of like a separate war crimes tribunal that, that is capable of uh, investigating and holding accountable those responsible for the crime of aggression. So everybody asks about Ukraine mostly because they want to know if Vladimir Putin's going to go to jail. And <laughs> he's not going to go to jail. Well, so actually, like, actually there, so he's not going to jail right now. There are a whole lot of things that would have to change domestically within Russia, but it doesn't mean those things won't happen. Um, I just hesitate to suggest that they would happen like today or tomorrow. Thank you. Hi. Okay, yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much. I guess a question I have is, so from listening to you, I feel like a challenge that I foresee is just time being um, available to people. And so I wonder, like, is it, when it comes to time being like a challenge factor and creating or establishing transitional justice approaches within a country, does the process have to be initiated by the people or can it be done by a smaller group? And I guess with that too, is the end goal then a cultural shift in, I know you were talking about like a, recognizing the past um, and like making that more part of the conversation. Well, it happens, this is a really, this is a really good question. Uh, it, it has and does happen at all levels. Um, so communities, um, like on a smaller scale, can implement certain kinds of things. Um, even sort of subnationally, like, okay, I'm gonna use the US as an example. States have created things like truth commissions. Maine had one. Um, they're like, actually, they're a bunch. I'm just, Maine's the one I can think of right now. Um, have, have created truth commissions. Uh, 
even in the wake of sort of inaction federally in the United States. Um, and that's true elsewhere in the world as well. Brazil is a good example of this. Nigeria has done things like this as well. Um, and sort of, there are smaller community practices that occur that many would call transitional justice as well. Whether those kinds of things can produce the desired outcome on a big scale, um, right? Can community practices in parts of the Amazon address sort of like larger cultural shifts? I'm thinking about like the Colombian Amazon. Can it, you know, promote large scale cultural shifts in Bogota? Like m maybe, uh, but the mechanism is going to be very very different than implementing it sort of at, at the state level. But it's not impossible. Um, well then with that too, like as people, like when these atrocities occur and the opportunity to then address them later on, there is the factor of time and people passing away. And so I'm thinking about comfort women in Korea, for example, which is, is it too, is there a moment when it's too, too late? late. Um, I would say there's no moment that's too late for transitional justice. Um, but what it's going to look like is going to be really different, and time plays a huge role in that, right? So are there going to be, well, I was going to say, are there going to be you know, criminal trials against uh, people for the sort of policies created uh, that supported this system of injustice? In Korea, no, probably not. Although I say that, and then I'm like, I don't know, they're still finding Nazis all the time. Like, no, Germany literally just sentenced somebody. <laughs> um, so, you know, anything is possible. Uh, but might a truth commission, for example, uh, be, be established? Um, and might that still be useful? I think certainly, um, depending on your view of what, of what should be the desired outcome. Hello, and thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, I was really interested in what you were mentioning about the international criminal courts, especially with the case of Uganda. Um, I had recently read a paper for an international law class regarding like how uh, in countries like Uganda and Sudan, they use the international criminal courts as like political institutions to frame like the rebel groups as the enemies and then themselves as like these allies of the inter liberal international in uh, organization. and. Like these courts and these like international institutions are meant to be apolitical. They're like ideally meant to be in this situation, and they were used as a political tool by these states. And do you see them, like, do you see that that kind of delegitimizing those institutions as effective mechanisms? And also, is it hindering transitional justice actually occurring? Because I don't know the post context of like the situation in Sudan, and Uganda. But since you were there, I wonder what your opinion on that is. Uh, this is another really great question. Uh, that's also a really great paper. I know what paper you're talking about. Everybody should read it. Um, um, so, do I? I think that there is a. I think that there is a. It, there is an open question about whether these institutions are really supposed to be apolitical. Um, I'm not sure that I. I agree with that. But as, as in, I don't agree that they are apolitical, and I don't agree that they should be apolitical. That being said. Oftentimes, they think they should be apolitical, or at least claim that they are and should be apolitical. And so given that they make these kinds of claims, the fact that they aren't, like I, I think, inherently creates a sort of de delegitimizing factor. Um, certainly, for victims of atrocities um, who like, don't fall on the right side of a political divide when they when they intervene. Um, do I think that this has hindered transitional justice? I think that, uh, so there's like a lingering question in the background here, which is like, what is true justice? Um, because is it hindering transitional justice as, it, as in like the implementation of a certain set of policies, like the mechanisms I just talked about? Uh, maybe not. But if the goal, are, the, of the goal of implementing transitional justice is to get the kinds of outcomes that I talked about when I talked about that why, that why TJ slide, right? If it's designed to get these things, then anything that's sort of reinforcing existing power dynamics, uh, which oftentimes the ICC, not always, but oftentimes the ICC is doing when it comes into places, 
I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to get us to here. Other things might, but it certainly isn't going to get us here. As somebody who studies the ICC, I'm like still very skeptical of it. <laughs> like I think it should exist, but I'm not sure it does all the things that we think it should. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, I hear it. I hear it. Over, over here. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming in to speak with us today. It's actually perfect that you have the slide up because I was. I know you mentioned that reconciliation as a goal of transitional justice was controversial. So I was wondering if you could kind of expand on the parts of reconciliation that are viewed as controversial, and also if you have any kind of personal thoughts on that conversation within the field that you'd like to share with us. Sure. Uh, so I think what makes it controversial is the idea that this is a goal that is attainable by anything. Um, so reconciliation, the idea of reconciliation as a goal of transitional justice is very much rooted in, um, like its origins is very much, are very much rooted in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, which was itself sort of rooted in uh, like reconciliation as a goal there was very much rooted in this sort of like Christian idea of like what it means to be reconciled with one and with one another and with the creator. Um, and so there the, the debates about rec about reconciliation as a goal are like what does reconciliation even mean, first of all? So we have to define it before we can we can sort of measure whether it's an attainable goal. Um, and there are lots of debates about what we should think reconciliation means. Um, and then sort of related to that is a, is a question of how you can even think of it on sort of like a large scale. Uh, reconciliation, even if we take sort of our common knowledge understanding of what we might think that is, is deeply sort of like interpersonal. What does social reconciliation look like? Um, if I'm a victim of atrocities and I say I forgive and am okay with living in harmony with those who've committed those atrocities against me, is society reconciled now? Like, what does that mean? Uh, so that's what the sort of controversy is, which is that like none of us can really get a grasp on what it even means to be able to say that it's something that's been achieved. Um, and so how can we possibly know if transitional justice is getting us there? Where do I stand on this? I don't think I even understand what reconciliation is as a social goal. Um, and so <laughs> I tend to fall on the side of like, I don't think that that should be a goal of transitional justice. And it's certainly the case that some mechanisms will never get us there. I don't understand how a trial leads to reconciliation. I just don't see it. Like, it might happen alongside a trial occurring, but I just don't see how putting somebody in jail is gonna to lead to anybody reconciling with anybody. So you mentioned how the 2020 movement in the US is also a form of transitional justice, and it made me think about the 1619 Project, and I was curious if you see that, since it is a memory project of sorts, if you see that as transitional justice and if you feel like it meets these stated goals of transitional justice? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, all these questions are really good. Uh, do I think that something like the 1619 Project, okay, so it probably wouldn't formally fall within the, within, like if, if you had, I'm less of a transitional justice purist than a lot of people, uh, but if you had a purist here, they would probably tell you it doesn't formally fall within the definitions because it was something not uh, sanctioned by the state. Um, as a non-purist, I think there are arguments that you could make for why it is. Do I think that it has contributed to any of the goals that I have up here on the screen? I think there is an argument to be made about uh, maybe not the big goals, but some of the smaller goals of transitional justice. Things like um, sort of like setting the record straight about things that have occurred in the past. Uh, but even that is, uh, and I, I didn't put these slides up because I didn't want to go too far over time. 
but even that, even those kinds of small goals are fraught with their own kinds of tensions. Um, and, and I think that the 1619 Project is a perfect example of why some of those tensions exist. Like whose record is the record we should be using? Um, history is complicated and it's hard to have a sort of definitive record of the truth of something that's happened. Um, and that can sow its own sorts of divisions. And I think the 1619 Project has done exactly that. But it doesn't mean it's not transitional justice, it just means that transitional justice can do these kinds of things as well. Hi. Um, my question is about after a long period of US military intervention and occupation, the Afghan government fell to um, you know, this nascent Taliban government. Um, and that conflict has been going on you know, since I was born. <laughs> so I'm wondering from a transitional justice perspective, what can be taken from that situation? Because you know, women were recently ordered to be removed from higher education. There, there are many people who are feeling um, that, that these are setbacks, but at the same time, perhaps efforts towards democratic consolidation or human rights promotion by the US military failed so miserably. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. It, it's a very complicated situation. Um, yeah. So this is uh, also a great question. And actually sort of rooted in, I didn't spend a ton of time talking about the sort of like normative philosophical debates that underpin questions of transitional justice, but I think it's actually in many ways rooted in that, which is like, what's the best way of going about getting these kinds of things? Um, and like, who gets to decide what, the, what a desired outcome should be? Um, so as you so eloquently put it, right, um, 20, 20 years, 20 plus years of US, <laughs> of US um, military intervention in Afghanistan seemed to have, depending on what metric you measure it by, failed, failed to achieve even sort of like the idea of a stable democracy. Um, and so what, like, what would intervention to promote something like transitional justice do? Um, like, I, I, don't, I don't know, I hesitate to say, but probably, probably not a ton of great stuff. Um, certainly not if it's underpinned by the West um, in general. Um, I guess my follow up to that is, do you think there was such a problem because this military aggressor was at the same time trying to impose you know, democratic ideals or, or at least saying that they were, do you believe that transitional justice really needs to be autonomously motivated? Like, it, is it harmful for international actors to, to intervene or, yeah, I guess that's what I'm wondering. Does it really need to be community-based? So I think that if your goal is any one of these, and even really any of the smaller ones, I don't know that that's something that can be imposed from the outside. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that intervention from the outside can't get you there, but there has to be demand from it, demand for it from below, um, at least some aspect of it. My research suggests that if you have, um, if you have sort of engaged communities on the ground, that are sort of promoting and supporting the kind of work that these international uh, institutions like the ICC do, you're much more likely to get the desired outcome of, um, in my case I study, or I look at uh, like holding perpetrators accountable for the things that they've done uh, domestically. And you're much more likely to get there if you've got both international and domestic working in tandem. Uh, if what you have is domestic opposition to it, then I, I just don't know how you can impose, you can't impose a demand for something. <laughs> we are at time, and I think we have time for just one more question. Three questions, so do you want to? Thank you, hi. 
Um, so it was really interesting to hear how like the current mechanisms of transitional justice doesn't seem to be enough anymore. And so I was wondering if you had any ideas of like some potential new mechanisms or ways we can change the current ones so that they actually get us to where we want to be. Oh, so I can't, okay, I hesitate to think of anything new um, in part because um, I think that anything that we would consider sort of like a new mechanism would probably fall into this, uh, would, would become, would be hyper local and would probably actually just fall under the heading of sort of like local practices. Um, because I think that the best ways to achieve at least some of the desired outcomes actually happen at a much smaller scale. Um, I think that oftentimes these things happen actually at the individual level rather than even at like a, like at the community level. Uh, but certainly some of these desired outcomes I think are better at the community level than trying to try like measure them at the country level. Um, and so anything new I think would probably fall into local practices. Um, and those don't have to be oftentimes people sort of root them in some concept of like indigenous practices or something like that. And they don't have to be that. Like it could just be like communities being like, we want to do a truth commission and that's fine too. Um, um, but do I think there are more effective ways of sort of thinking about the mechanisms that we have? Uh, yeah, so I study, again, I study the like criminal trials but at the international level. And as uh, I said in my previous answer, I think that engaging groups on the ground um, sort of more directly uh, who are demanding these kinds of things, demanding accountability for the people who have committed atrocities um, in their country or region, can make those institutions more effective at getting the outcome that they're looking for which is ultimately to hold these people accountable, not necessarily to hold them accountable internationally. Okay, I realize there are like a million more questions um, and, and, and I'm not at all surprised um, given Dr. Bates's work. So I wanna take a moment, thank you so much for joining us today. Aww.